Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. Episode 174, recorded for the week of July 20th, 2022. The Cloud Pod goes the distance with Rocky Linux. Good evening, Ryan, Peter, and Jonathan. Good evening. Hola. Hello. Yeah, it's uh, it's been another fantastic week here at the cloud. It's a there's a bit of a heat wave though, if you guys have heard uh, from mm-hmm. our UK listeners, so they're they may be a little bit hot under the weather. Uh, but uh, you know, maybe they can start out their first story with a trip to the data lake uh, to cool off just a little bit. Very nice. And yeah, yeah. Thank you, Data Lake uh, Solutions. Uh, Venture Beat has an interesting article on the top ten data lake solution vendors in 2022. From their opinion. Uh, First, to clarify what VentureBeat means by Data Lake, they define it as a single centralized repository that can store massive amounts of unstructured and semi-structured information in its native raw format. Uh, They believe there are five must-haves for Data Lake solution. It has to have various interfaces, APIs, and endpoints, uh, support for or connection to processing and analytical layers, a robust search and cataloging feature, security and access controls, and flexibility and scalability. Uh, and so, with no further ado, there's the ten items uh, they came up with. First up was AWS, and this is all in alphabetical order, so don't take, don't read too much into the ordering here. Uh, AWS was up first with uh, their great solutions using the AWS Data Lake solution. Cloudera, the granddaddy of all data lakes with Hadoop, of course, and their Cloudera XTX Data Lake solution. Databricks, uh, another enterprise vendor out there that can get you a data lake. Domo, uh, Google Cloud, HP Enterprise. That one doesn't feel very cloudy. IBM, oh, we're getting really bad now. IBM, huh? <laughs> Microsoft Azure, Oracle, and then finally wrapping up the list alphabetically with Snowflake. Any uh, any surprises there for you guys? Anybody you haven't seen out there in the big data space? I, I know I haven't seen Domo. That one kind of caught me by surprise, but everyone else I've at least heard of. I mean, I was surprised by, you know, the, the reference to HP for sure. Um, just mostly because I haven't heard that anywhere like other than the commercial for green lake <laughs> which you know or in the airport as you're going through running through the airport you know there's a green lake <laughs> sign uh you know next to the anti-spam device company i don't remember the name at this moment but uh, yeah one of those yeah it, it, it started out well because it uh, was with a green lake solution hpe offers a scalable cloud-based solution that simplifies your hadoop experience and then it goes, HPE GreenLake is an end-to-end solution that includes software, hardware, and HPE Point Next services. I'm like, hardware? Hardware is on mm-hmm. cloud, guys? What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, it's private cloud. Yeah, okay. Private cloud. It's real private. So oh, private, you can't get to your data lake. Yeah, I think that this list is basically like like 10 of the top five uh, big uh, data lake solutions out there. So. Yeah, I mean, from your guys' opinion, uh, knowing what you know about data lakes, you know, who are your guys' top three? I'm just out of curiosity. I mean, I think the best data lake is the one that's got your boat on it, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can. It's it's hard to answer this, you know. Like, a, I know a lot of people have been very successful with Cloudera. Um, they, you know, there's a lot of high touch management that they do for a lot of businesses that really, you know, fit the needs. But you know, you can do you know, if you're looking for more agile and spin up and down, you know, maybe go somewhere, you know, something like a- the AWS solution or Databricks. Um, I haven't had any experience with Google Cloud data, but I'm sure I will soon. I mean, they're, the data proc is Hadoop and Spark. So a lot of mm-hmm. these are kind of the same thing. They're all a Hadoop-based engine of some sort that leverages Spark or some other, other uh, Hadoop family product. Um, so I mean, I I think the one through that come to my mind when I think data lake is is of course AWS data lake, uh, Cloudera, and then probably Snowflake. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are the, the three that come to mind. Databricks I'd never really thought of as a as a data lake company because I thought of them more as a big data science company. But it does make sense. They, and I assume that since I looked at their product last, they've added this capability because it just makes sense they would have one. Uh, so that one probably is my fourth if I were to be on the bubble. But uh, everyone else on the list, I'm sure, like, yeah, that's okay. I'll I'll keep looking. Yeah, I think I'd be Google, AWS, and Snowflake. Nice. Yeah, I guess you got to think about who who's going to innovate the best to to bring you new solutions to help extract more value from that data where it is now, and that's going to be AWS, Google, probably Snowflake. Um, you don't put your data in a, in, a, in a in a data lake and then find that. Actually, it's not really a data lake. It's just a bucket, and it's stored there, and you can't really do anything with it. You've got to move it someplace else. 
I think the integration to other services are, uh, are key in choosing where to put the data in the first place. So I, that's, um, that's, that's where I go. It was interesting, your choices there, because you, you said AWS and Google and then Snowflake. And of those three, uh, Snowflake to me, and actually Domo and Databricks are probably the three that I would think would have the most innovation in the space, because that's the only thing they do. <laughs> Where at least in the Google and AWS space, they're, they run a lot of things, uh, not just a data lake. And so, yeah, I would think that if you're looking for cutting edge innovation, you'd be looking for a company that just as this as a primary business versus, you know, I need a commodity service. I want that from a probably one of the big cloud providers and eventually I'll get the sexy features, but I won't get the really super innovative stuff right away or until it's baked enough that it's into mainline Hadoop uh, in a big way. So that, that's sort of my take on that from how you answer the question, but I'm curious why you think it's AWS and Google before some of the other vendors. I think it's just the, the broader um, suite of integrations. I mean, if, if you've got data that's 20 years old, 15 years old, 10 years old, it's been sitting there. You want to try and extract more value or as much value as you can out of that data, whether it's customer data or some other kind of data. I think you'll be more likely to be able to use the services, the, the broader range of services from, from the cloud providers than um, from, let's say, HP. Exactly. Yeah, I don't know what I'm going to want to do with this data later, so I might as well put it somewhere where I have the most likelihood of having the tools available to me um, that allow me to do what I want to do. And given the yeah. fact I don't know what I want to do, I want the broadest set of tools available. Yeah, I mean, it's great if you know what you want to do with the data, but um, with AWS and GCP, at least you can use machine learning and you can, you can look for insights in data that you didn't even know were there. Makes sense. All right, well, let's move on to AWS stories. Uh, so the information this week had an interesting look at the technical differentiator uh, Graviton is for AWS, uh, particularly when competing with both Google and Microsoft. Uh, the information apparently talked to six AWS customers who told the information that cloud servers using Graviton processors consume less power and can deliver higher speeds than the servers made by Intel or AMD. The Graviton servers are being used by large customers like Twitter, Snap, Adobe, and SAP. And after three years, it's a multi-billion dollar business for AWS, uh, which apparently is because uh, it's roughly 10% of the EC2 revenue, which is about half of the $62 billion revenue that AWS generates. So Graviton has become a pretty lucrative business. Uh, customers say they can save up to 10 to 40% on their compute cost, and this has put more pressure on rivals, especially with the recent launch of the third generation of the Graviton chip. Not only are customers liking Graviton, partners are scrambling to take advantage, as well as including Databricks. And since April, Databricks has apparently been running a trial on Graviton 2, and their customers are designing performance increases of 20 to 40%, while cloud costs increased for them 20 to 40%. Uh, of course, Graviton is all powered by Annapurna Labs, acquisition by AWS. Uh, giving AWS a huge boost and head start over their competitors. Uh, apparently, Microsoft is reportedly designing its own ARM-based chip, and Google has said it has plans to do so as well. Uh, in the meantime, they're both offering you capabilities from Ampere Computing, the Alta uh, series of ARM chips, uh, and Oracle also offers that to you as well. Uh, of course, if you are a SaaS provider who charges by the compute uh, usage like Snowflake, this can be a bad thing because the <laughs> customers leveraging Graviton t- uh, 2 or 3 where Snowflake are processing their data 10% faster which means that they have a 10% revenue miss uh, to Snowflake because they charge you by the CPU drip, uh, which resulted in a $100 million uh, hit to revenue, although Snowflake does say they will recover quite nicely from that uh, as customers take advantage of the lower costs, but even more data into the cloud. Uh, of course, demand is high with the supply chain, and so you can't always provision these things quickly enough uh, or in the region you want to, so do take it with a grain of salt. But if you haven't checked out Graviton uh, and you have a server run inside app, I would definitely check it out. Uh, when you have a chance, because it's quite a nice uh, boost for performance and cost. Yeah, I mean, the power of Graviton is how easy it is, you know, for for most applications to adopt and just get instant cost savings and performance increases. Um, it's it's amazing to me just at, that they're already that much representative of of EC two revenue. It's nuts. Feels like it was released yesterday. I mean, yeah. It does feel like it was yesterday, but I was looking at the dates and 2018, I think, was the first one. So it's, yeah. you know, it's it's been longer than you think. It's a pandemic. Mm-hmm. It's, it feels like it's been an eternity, but it really hasn't been as long as you think. It's just the, the staggering number, 10% of, you know, the EC2 footprint. Or, I mean, it's revenue, not footprint, but crazy. If I were Intel and I were looking at my business forecast for the next 10 years, I better be taking this into account. Well, I mean, I think that's Intel's play, right? Is eventually to get to the point where they can manufacture ARM chips for companies who are designing their own chips. 
Uh, but uh, you know, they got to make that transition as well as they're trying to maintain their legacy until Xeon business, which has been a cash cow for them for a very long time. So, I just mean AWS as a customer. Oh, yeah. I mean, eventually, you, if Graviton is so much better and everything is supporting it, why would you continue to buy Intel or AMD in this heavy, heavy volume uh, other than for legacy customers? And you had to say that Amazon probably has a significant amount of legacy Intel processors at this point in their fleet. And when, yeah, I mean, if they were Cisc based, I, I think that Amazon already would have stopped buying Intel chips. Yeah, could be. So, well, I mean, and the, the amount of iteration that can happen in these things quickly. I mean, Apple has the M1 they released a year ago. They've already released the M2 with 30% better performance over the M1. You know, and we've seen Graviton 1, 2, and 3 each have a pretty big jump. The Graviton 3 being the response to the the Ampere uh, arm, which was leapfrogging the Graviton 2. So there, it's kind of an arms race, which is sort of fun <laughs> to watch yeah. and see these guys kind of go down this path of who can get there faster, cheaper, and more efficiently and, and give you the best bang for your buck. So it's a fun time to be uh, someone who needs a lot of compute power. I remember ARM CPUs were one of my predictions for uh, for cloud, for all clouds, a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, didn't materialize until this year. So finally, I think all three big, big clouds have got... Um, ARM-based CPUs. Yeah. Clearly, AWS were ahead of the curve because they're four years ahead of everyone else. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's what happens when you buy a chip company <laughs> early when you did. <laughs> and, you, know, you have to wonder, too, like, because Annapurna, some of the very first things they did were really focusing on optimizing networking and disk storage and, and you know, really sub-hypervisor problems. Do you, when they bought that company, do you think they thought, oh, you know, we could have the entire compute unit run by ARM at some point in the future? Or are they really... Or did they have that vision, you know, four years before they came out with Graviton, or is that something that just kind of materialized over time as things got cheaper, faster, and more efficient? I think it was intentional. I mean, with the Apple Apple's move and AWS's move, you know, like they're these things don't happen fast, and so I, I think it, if it was accidentally, it would have it'd be taken longer. Yeah, do uh, acquisition up and down the stack of your service offering is an obvious play for AWS. I think the thing that surprised me most about this was that they they, ca- they called out the not paying the the Intel tax on the CPUs rather than it being a ongoing saving for power. I, I would have assumed, not knowing anything else, that the most of the savings would have come from operational costs. But um, sp- specifically, they mentioned the the cost of the the silicon for Intel versus the cost of silicon that they make from uh, TSMC. That's kind of interesting because that goes to the you know the ten percent. Uh, representing ten percent of the revenue that factors in, like the cost to run, I hadn't I hadn't really thought about it that way. But that would make sense why it's growing so fast as well. Yeah. Well, uh, as your applications change, Amazon uh, Elastic Volumes allow you to increase capacity, tune your performance, and change the type of your EBS volumes. Uh, customers who are using EBS EV volumes to migrate to GP three volumes and save to twenty percent per gigabyte compared to the GP two volumes can now do that more automatically with the new Elastic Volumes capability to change from GP2 to GP3. EBS will automatically provision the GP3 volume with the proper IOPS and throughput equivalent to the original GP2 volume, and this removes all guesswork out of the provisioning GP3 performance for your applications, making it even easier to migrate to GP3 volumes and save costs. Which I read this and I'm like, that's really cool until this thing provisions PyOps and then I'm mad about it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but I, I do know, I do remember Jonathan working on some of the GP2 to GP3 conversions and the calculations required here. So there is, it was not a, a simple just go change the flag from GP2 to GP3. There was some thought that had to go into it. So it's nice to see Amazon's taking that, that toil away from this process. Well, a lot of the, a lot of the conversion math is actually comparing cost, which Amazon is not providing you. So if you do have a high throughput workload, you might see a price increase with that move. But unlikely. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely some edge cases where that does happen. But again, if it starts recommending PyOps, it'll definitely happen because <laughs> PyOps are expensive. But uh, yeah. No PyOps. I mean, every time I put PyOps in, I always regret it later because you never actually use them is what I typically find and you're paying a premium. But you know, I'm sure there's somebody out there who does actually need them. I just was never me. Usually when things go wrong is when, it's when, uh, it's when you're using them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. It's very anti-cloud, right? You're, it's pre-provisioning at the base layer. 
Well, one of the core tenets of your security framework on AWS is most likely VPC flow logs, which you use to track uh, ports and destination source addresses uh, between different nodes in your VPC. And one of the challenges, of course, when they came out of the Transit Gateway is that Transit Gateway did not support VPC flow logs, you know, crippling some of your ability to see traffic patterns in your network. And so AWS is finally announcing VPC flow logs for Transit Gateway, which is a new capability that allows customers to gain deeper visibility and insights into network traffic on the Transit Gateway. You can now export detailed information such as source and destination IP, port, protocol, traffic counters, timestamps, and various metadata for all network flow traversing through the Transit Gateway. Uh, and in this particular article I've linked to here, we'll walk you through how to set up this capability and increase the visibility of all of your networking, as well as walk you through the intricacies of the API call, which can be quite complex if you've never seen it before. Uh, so do check out the walkthrough. It's quite well done. Can't be nearly as complex as trying to actually follow a network communication from VPC through the transit gateway into another VPC, which then hits a middleware you know, request that you also need to figure out. Like it's crazy to me like you know how how complex the distributed model really got for visualizing network traffic and so it's this is a great thing to have and making it a lot easier which is fantastic i like easy yeah and for a lot of people they turn on flow logs for compliance purposes and all these flow logs were available before just by turning on flow logs on all of the vpcs and this to me seems like a for people who are actually going to use it and not just turning it on for compliance purposes makes it super uh, more, just way more uh, efficient because you can pick what you're actually, what's going through the transit gateway. So it seems pretty cool. And if you uh, don't know what to do with all the data you get from your full logs and you turn it on, uh, there are partners like Datadog and others that will actually ingest the data and actually give you those nice pretty visualizations uh, versus you having to parse that yourself through the log files. Or there's you know the top ten you know data lakes just throw it in there <laughs> just throw it in the data lake it's a problem <laughs> shouldn't we well in that case why don't we just do the full network mirroring into the data lake <laughs> I've been asked to set that up <laughs> got as far as the pricing and then <laughs> conversation weirdly ended <laughs> suddenly it didn't seem such a good idea <laughs> yeah a hundred terabit network can can uh, cost an awful lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like so many sins and acts. Yeah, you had to you had to really care yeah. what's on those packets uh, versus the I mean, the flow logs cover most of what you need. So, <laughs> well, AWS is announcing App Config Extensions, a new capability that allows customers to enhance and extend the capabilities of feature flags and dynamic configuration data. AWS App Config Extension Framework exposes action points along the lifecycle of a feature flag and configuration data set. Customers can hook new functionality onto each action point. And action points are then exposed during the creation, validation, deployment, and rollback feature of a feature flag and configuration data. Available extensions at launch include app config notifications that allow you to push messages to event bridge, SNS, or SQS. And there's also a Jira extension which will allow customers to track feature flag changes and app config as individual issues at Leisure and Jira. Further, customers can create their own extensions. For example, if you wanted to extend the built-in automatic rollback functionality by calling a Lambda function if a rollback occurred, you can now do that through a custom Lambda extension. Or if you need to pull configuration data from another source like a database or a Git repo to be merged into other app config data prior to deployment, you can do that through a custom uh, plugin as well. This is super neat. I, you know, like I just I don't have a direct use case for this other than you know tracking you know you know that uh, either a feature flag was enabled so it can correlate with some other data, you know, to see if there's a change in performance or. Or if you're doing any kind of investigation for, you know, that kind of level or rollbacks, right? And so, like, it's it's neat. It's a neat tool um, that I'm not sure how I'm going to use yet. You know, that kind of thing. So, step one: enable feature mm-hmm. flag. Yeah. <laughs> step two: figure out all this. <laughs> yeah, really. So yeah. Step, step three. What's step three? Profit. 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 Profit of course. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is this is clearly the step two part of feature flags, but uh, you know, with other feature flagging capabilities you've gotten in both app config and the new feature flagging capability, um, you know, you're getting more and more options to do this natively in the AWS platform, which is nice. I thought we we're going to have like a, a throwback to the our very first episode back then with the uh, the whole step one, put the feature flag in the box. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Well, I know. Um, you guys all love to build web applications. Oh yeah. And I know that that you guys love UI frameworks. Oh, more and than I'm life sure itself. that you've 
yeah, you've always looked at the AWS management console and you said, you know what? That is a dynamic, awesome <laughs> UI construct and platform that I wish I could get access to. I'm sure it's all, you guys have all said it every day. Hey, if I could make all my applications look like the AWS console, like, you know, that's success, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, Amazon has you this week with the new Cloudscape design system, an open source solution for building intuitive, engaging, and inclusive user experiences at scale. The Cloudscape consists of an extensive set of guidelines to create web apps, along with design resources and front end components to streamline your implementation. Cloudscape was built for and is used by AWS products and services, originally created in 2016 to improve the user experience across AWS applications and also to help teams implement those apps faster. Uh, if you've ever used AWS Manager Console, you've seen Cloudscape in action. So you're welcome. Amazon is releasing Cloudscape as open source so that anyone building cloud products can benefit from their design system and join a community of designers and developers who continually improve it. Whether you're building a product that extends the AWS Management Console, designing a user interface for a hybrid cloud management system, or setting up an on-premise solution that uses AWS Cloudscape offers a solid base of 60 components, 30 plus pattern guidelines, and 20 plus demos to make your work easy today. And all I have to say is I really kind of am bothered by the fact that a multi-billion dollar company would like me to work on their UI framework for them as open source. I'm a little bothered by that on this one, just a little bit. Uh, but, you know, here we are. I just read it as they couldn't sell it. <laughs> <laughs> which, which takes me to my uh, to, to, to what it reminds me of, which is when HP bought Palm and then a couple of years later open sourced Palm OS. Oh, yes. I remember that. You know, I, I hope it leads to one thing, because I, I've long thought it would be really nice to be able to embed my own custom dashboards or applications or services into the Amazon web console. You know, if, I, if, I, if I'm an SRE team and I've got access to you know, the, the uh, AWS console metrics, CloudWatch logs, all those kind of things, I would really like to be able to embed my own custom widgets, my own custom apps into the into that one console. And everyone always talks about the single pane of glass. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to to put your own custom business logic, to have your own custom dashboards, very app specific things that maybe don't work well with with um, CloudWatch logs or metrics or any of those other things, but have it sort of natively um, embedded in into the web console. So if I can use the same tool that they use to build their fairly crappy UI experience, then maybe maybe the next step is I can then inject my own apps into into the experience of my developers or SRE team. I did catch that when they talked about extending the design of the AWS management console with this tool. Uh, I did sort of wonder if this is a lead into a future innovation around that cable. Because that's one of the complaints I have about um, you know some of the cost management tools that want to take over the instance creation process. Uh, Spot comes to mind, right? Where it's great if you're just using Terraform or if you're just using a command line because it's all integrated there. But when you go to the AWS console, all of a sudden you can't see the spot stuff and you have to go to a different login, a different system. And that that user experience is broken at that point for me. And that doesn't happen on Google. I don't think it even happens on Azure where they actually plug right into the console and they're part of the native console experience. Um, And so it's not so a big deal to do that. So I, I am curious if this is going to eventually lead to an expansion of the, of the management console so you can have partners come into it, which would be really cool. Uh, so I, I am I was sort of intrigued that that was mentioned as part of the benefits of this tool, uh, which maybe this is the pieces leading to a reinvent announcement or a, a reinforced announcement of some sort. Yeah, nice. I, mean, I think other things like the, uh, the, the public quick site links where you can share dashboards with people, wouldn't it be nice if you could brand those with your own Logos, your own contact information, service tests, that kind of thing, and so you can give give sort of native cloud dashboards out to your customers, but it's still branded with your own um, your own info instead yeah. of Amazon's. Yeah, That'd I think cool. we're going to be disappointed if that's what we're hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> no disappointment today. <laughs> I mean, I want my, I want my Foghorn managed dashboards with your Foghorn logo on them. Why not? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, if that's the, if that's all we get out of this, then that's not so great. But if that's one of many features, if anybody's going to open, if anybody's going <laughs> to open source templates and graphics, it would be Foghorn because Amazon has done a million things way better than Foghorn, but not graphics. <laughs> we kick their butt on graphics. <laughs> Very true. If you don't like the 1970s burnt orange. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've seen your logo. Beautiful. It's all that different. <laughs> 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 Away, man. Away. I was speaking of Foghorn, are you are you getting a new ad for them this week, Jonathan? That our listeners can hear. Yes. 
Yes, yes. you are. Jonathan, yes, yes. I already put it in the thing and it's perfect. And it's fun and it's different. It's not really that fun. But I mean, as fun as you can get when it comes to <laughs> trying to sell consulting services. It's fun enough. <laughs> uh, I, I was, that's why he knows your logo so well, though. He's been he's been looking at the logo for inspiration for the ad read he's going to do <laughs> at some point this week to get into the show. So if, if our listeners are listening to this and the, and the wrong ad plays, then you'll know that we didn't get that done. But that's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the terms of the renewal of the sponsorship was so we had to change the ad. I've heard years. some listeners say they can quote it from memory at this point. So, you know. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> have you been waiting months and months to hire your new AWS, GCP, or Azure architect only to have them be poached at the 11th hour by a startup with a juice bar? Initiative stalled because you're having trouble hiring? Well, I have a simple solution, Falcon Consulting. Falcon Consulting provides top-notch cloud engineers to the world's most innovative companies and can be burning down your DevOps and cloud backlogs as soon as next week. Falcon certified AWS, GCP, and Azure professionals are armed with infrastructure as code and from day one will be designing performant, optimized cloud-native or hybrid environments that deliver on the promise of cloud. Their FogOps solution even provides on-demand cloud engineering to augment your existing teams. Visit www.foghornconsulting.com or send an email to cloudtalentnow at foghornconsulting.com and tell them the CloudPod sent you. Your dedicated FogOps team is with you for the long haul and they bring their own juice. All right, well, let's move on to Epic processors. Uh, if you uh, were excited for the C6A and then you were excited for the M6A, but you were like, man, I just need either one of those configurations with just way more memory and way more processing power. I have you this week with the R6A for memory intensive workloads on the AMD Epic processor, which are 10% less expensive and comparable to the x86 instances. And you can get the R6A instance and a large configuration of two vCPUs and 16 gigs of memory or 192 vCPU up to 1.5 terabytes of memory with all the fancy networking, all the fanciness of the R6A, R6, R5 family all to you today on the Epic processor. And so I think we can finally stop talking about Epic processors because I think they've now cl- rolled it out across all three of the primary node types. And so you're welcome. <laughs> Nothing better than just sticking your whole database in RAM and telling everyone you did a kick butt job of improving performance. Mm-hmm. It's great for one customer. It doesn't work so well for multiples. <laughs> And we'll move on from that epic story to Google, who has uh, a bunch of new things for us this week as well. Uh, so first up is the Vertex AI uh, capability. So when you deploy a model to the Vertex AI prediction service, each model is by default deployed to its own virtual machine. Uh, but to make cost hosting more cost-effective now, Google is excited to introduce model co-hosting in preview, which allows you to host multiple models on the same VM, resulting in better utilization of memory and computational resources. You can deploy multiple models to the VM depending on model size and traffic patterns. This feature is particularly useful for scenarios where you have many deployed deployed models with sparse traffic. So think your dev environments where you'd like them to test the model, but you don't want to deploy thousands of VMs to do so. Uh, this is a great use case for that. So good to see this one come in. Uh, multi-tenant uh, model hosting on a server. Thanks. Woo! <laughs> I see, the, I see the stunned reactions of both of you. you guys are- I, was, I was looking at the unmute button. I just didn't get there in time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, surely the next step is, is just to make it entirely entirely serverless, so you don't even have to worry about that. Yes, you could you could do that too. That'd be nice. Would that be one of those serverless models where we choose how much CPU and RAM we want? Most likely, yes. On our on our serverless <laughs> service, yes. <laughs> those are my favorite serverless models. Well, for those of you who uh, were, live in the Linux world, like Jonathan, uh, Peter, Ryan, and I do, uh, you are aware of the fact that CentOS uh, is going off to pasture. CentOS 7 will reach end of life later this year, uh, and many companies are considering their options for enterprise-grade downstream Linux distribution on which to run their production applications. Uh, and some of them have adopted Fedora Core as their future home, and uh, if you like Fedora, then you're super happy with those things, like on Amazon Linux, uh, which is adopting that. Uh, but if you're like, man, I really just want that CentOS thing that I always used to love and have, uh, Rocky Linux apparently has emerged as the strong alternative to that. Uh, like CentOS, it is 100% compatible with Red Hat. 
uh, which is great. And so because of that, Google has announced uh, last year in April a partnership with CIQ, which is the official support and service partner and sponsor of Rocky Linux, as a first step in providing a best-in-class enterprise-grade support experience on Rocky Linux on Google Cloud. And today, they're announcing the GA of Rocky Linux optimized for Google Cloud. Google developed this collection of compute engine virtual machine images in collaboration with CIQ so you can get optimal performance when using Rocky Linux on the compute engine. These new images are customized variants of the Rocky Linux kernel and modules that optimize networking performance on compute engine infrastructure while retaining bug-for-bug compatibility with community Rocky Linux and Red Hat Linux. The customizations enable high bandwidth networking, which is beneficial to any workload, but particularly for HPC workloads. And going forward, Google will publish both the community and optimize for Google Cloud edition for Rocky for every major release on the Google Cloud platform. Wow, whoever thought the starting point would be that we have the same bugs that somebody else does. <laughs> I thought the same thing. I was like, huh, yeah. I don't know if that's a selling point to me, but yeah. okay. Yeah. I, I was totally hoping this was going to get kicked to the lightning random and I could make a comment about Bullwinkle Linux, but uh, I didn't, so... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm happy about this mostly just because I've I've never been all that comfortable operating in Fedora, and it is like you know, old man yelling in his yard. But you know, because it is really just that it's a comfort level of what I'm used to and knowing where things are. Especially now when I have to look up everything, you know, I'd rather be <laughs> easy easier where I can get it. <laughs> um, Rocky is definitely a better name. For a, and much yeah. an operating system than CentOS. I mean, I get it. Fedora, Red Hat, the plan where it's just cute. Well, I mean, so Rocky uh, in this context is actually one of the one of the two founders of CentOS. I think maybe it's two or three. I don't. I apologize if I messed this up. But uh, he died a few years ago from from cancer, I think. And so they named this new version yeah. of CentOS basically after him, which is why it's named Rocky Linux. Um, I love it. So it that's a, that's part of the story that's there. That's awesome. You, you can check that out on their website. They have a whole little paragraph in there about us, uh, about how they named the product after one of the founders of CentOS. Oh, I feel a little bad now about naming the show after going toe to toe with the guy. Well, I mean, there's Rocky, <laughs> the other You're Rocky. Honoring <laughs> no, you're honoring him. You're honoring him. It's awesome. Yeah. His name is in. I love it. <laughs> yes, we're talking about the Rocky, the boxer, not Rocky, the man in this that's right. case. But uh, yeah, show title issues, show title issues. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad to see Google finally just getting a Linux foundation that they're going to go after and make their standard, right? So the, I assume that you'll start seeing Rocky Linux as their standard for GKE and for all the different ways, just like Amazon Linux 2 kind of took over the world at AWS as well, where you know, it's either that or Bottle Rocket. Those are your two choices. And so now in Google, you can use Ubuntu, which is one of the preferred uh, platforms, or you can use Rocky, which is great. Yeah, it's, it's good. It answers the question of who do we shout at if there's a bug, um, you know, a zero day, and the community doesn't get around to fixing it. Now we can shout at, now we can shout at Google. Well, Google is announcing a ARM-based processor VM this week. The first preview release of their VM family powered by the Tau T2A, powered by the Ampere Ultra ARM-based processor. The T2A VMs deliver exceptional single-threaded performance at a compelling price. The Tau T2A VMs come in a multiple predefined VM shapes with up to 48 vCPUs per VM and 4 gigs of memory per vCPU. Supporting several core Google services including GKE, Dataflow, and Batch. We'll talk about more here in a second. Uh, so if you want ARM on Google, they've got you with the Ampere uh, infrastructure. Yeah, but what's this Batch thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's that? Batch? I don't yeah. know what that is. Uh, just thinking, maybe Amazon should get into the selling Graviton three to all the other cloud providers' business. I'm <laughs> just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make this a twelve billion dollar business. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think uh, it's much more likely that Google or Microsoft buy Intel. Yeah. Intel? Nah, nah. You could probably you could probably get better value by buying, just like Amazon did. You know, a designer rather than manufacturer. Well, that's fine. That's fine. But buy somebody. Don't. Buy from your. It makes no sense to buy from your chief competitor because now you're handcuffed with that additional margin you have to pay for processors. I mean, we've done it for decades with Microsoft and Intel. Why not do it with mm-hmm. Amazon? <laughs> so, because they, Intel didn't compete with Microsoft. No, you. But we all bought it as a Microsoft and Intel tax on all of our systems for decades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, no. I I hear you. <laughs> All right, well, I just mentioned it, Batch. Google is announcing a preview, in preview, Batch, a fully managed service to provide easy access to Google Cloud computing power and scale. Uh, Batch processing, of course, is old as the dinosaur, dating all the way back to punch cards. 
Uh, batches use resources efficiently and remains the preferred way of running jobs that don't need human interaction. Enterprise workloads often include some batch element. Enterprise turns to Google Cloud to meet the needs for their more compute resources or to ease access to the latest processor GPUs. They bring their batch workloads along with them, those darn hippies. The new batch services uh, handle several essential tasks, including managing the job queue, provisioning and auto-scaling resources, running your jobs, executing the subtasks, and deals with common errors that could occur in your batch processing. All accessible via the API, the G Cloud command line tool, workflow engine, or via the UI in a cloud console. Easy format. I look forward to testing this out because I was very unsatisfied with AWS's batch service. Um, nothing feels less batchy than having to maintain like an ECS cluster and, and custom configurations for said cluster. And then, you know, defining your, your batch configuration all just so that you can launch, you know, batch processes that, you know, just operate, you know, fan out and do the thing and come back. That part's cool, but yep. it was very clear that batch was, you know, something they developed to use under the hood, you know, I assume for um, step functions or something like that. And they sort of productized it enough to release and just never really polished it up. And I don't remember seeing any updates to that batch service. So I'm really hoping that Google, you know, took their time and in, in that design and they, you know, and it usually is around the user experience where Google, you know, mops the floor with AWS. So hopefully this is the same. Yeah, you kind of took the words out of my mouth there because the Amazon's batch service so it kind of left me thinking. So, what exactly are you doing for me here? Yeah, like I, I got to manage all this other stuff anyway. I mean, what, what's yeah. the value add? <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> virtually nothing is the answer. So, yeah, good luck. It was yeah, it was much easier for me to just to schedule you know an ECS task than use batch in the end. And so, like one one POC one experiment, and I was done. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it's because you you had a person who said we need to have batch as a requirement for our cloud provider, and so they checked the box, and so that's what they mm-hmm. got. Uh, you know, it, it was interesting. Uh, I didn't include all the examples they had for what Batch can do for you, but uh, you know, there's jobs as a service. Uh, it can provision compute resources for you if you want to do uh, things like the T2A ARM instances. Uh, they can use accelerator optimized resources from NVIDIA and GPU type stuff. They give you support for common job types, uh, handle any executable. They handle pr- flexible provisioning models, including Spot, on day one. <laughs> And they simplify nice. the native integration with Google Cloud Services as well as popular workflow engines and tools such as Nextflow and the D sub command line tool. Uh, so, and there's definitely a lot more here that came out of the box. Uh, I was surprised that GKE wasn't mentioned as a way to launch and run these batch things, but I think it's because GKE already has some of that capability. But uh, yeah, uh, if you want to get into this, you can email the GCP batch preview mailbox and you can get right into this program uh, as long as you're willing to give them some feedback on what you think. Yeah, I mean, it's that. You know, or, or it's because of the the use case that I mentioned. Like for you know, my my experience was AWS with ECS based, but the same thing goes for GKE. It might just be easier to launch a whole bunch of containers using that and have them do what I need. For sure. Well, uh, let's move on to Azure. Uh, so, if you were previously confused about our many conversations about premium and ultra premium storage. Uh, I have a new flavor of storage to add to your nightmares this week. With the premium SSD V2 storage, which is the next generation of Microsoft's Azure premium SSD disk disk storage, the new disk offering provides the most advanced block storage solution designed for a broad range of IO-intensive enterprise production workloads that require sub-millisecond disk latencies, as well as high IOPS and throughput at a low cost. With premium SSD V2, you can now present up to 64 terabytes of storage capacity, 80,000 IOPS, and 1,200 megabits per second throughput on a single disk. With best-in-class IOPS and bandwidth, Premium SSD V2 provides the most flexible and scalable general-purpose block storage in the cloud. And the key benefits are you can grow it in one gigabyte increments, the independent provisioning of IOPS throughput in gigabytes, not all tied together, consistent sub-millisecond latency, and easier maintenance with scaling performance up and down without downtime. And in the article, they gave us a handy-dandy chart to show you the differences between UltraDisk, Premium SSD V2, and Premium SSD. And uh, really, the big thing uh, is that you're getting some IOPS for free, you're getting some baseline throughput for free, uh, you're getting about half of the UltraDisk peak IOPS performance and about a fourth of the peak throughput, but compared to the Premium SSD you used to have, uh, you're getting a significant upgrade over the legacy premium SSD. So if you were paying that premium price and not getting premium service, you can now get premium SSD V2 premium service before going to UltraDisk, which might be a nice stepping stone for you before you go to pay all the monies to Azure. That's how I think I can see this. So just off the top of my head, I'm 
take a look at that list for, for, for the new best V2 premium offering. It looks about comparable with what AWS's GP2 volumes used to be. They, they provide the same um, 125 megabits a second throughput, 3,000 IOPS is standard. And that was replaced two years ago. It was not good enough, and they replaced it with GP3. So, I mean, catch up, as you're. It's not good enough. <laughs> that's, uh, that's how it works. <laughs> I mean, you can get the performance. You just have to pay for it, right? That, that's, I think that's the big thing, is that they don't have the infrastructure, and so therefore supply and demand is going to dictate that that's more expensive. So, because it's, you know, you need that you need that increase in megabits per second or you're just going to have to provision a larger larger disk and you're going to pay for it. But yeah. think of the SQL servers. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, looking at the the comparison to the premium SSD, if I were to compare it to the GP2, um, it is closer to the, you know, the V2 is definitely closer to the v, the GP2, but I'd say it's it's somewhere a little bit maybe halfway. Like It's like a GP2.3 release. It's not quite 3.0, but it's definitely not 2.0. It's a little better, but not not much better. So how's that? Uh, well, Azure uh, is committed to helping developers and organizations using AI responsibly by protecting the rights and safety of customers. Uh, and so Azure is announcing some service updates to Azure Cognitive Services consistent with their new AI principles, which we talked about previously. Uh, and so beginning June 21st, uh, 2022, customers of Azure must register and receive approval for access to the following services. The Face API, if you want to identify and verify features. Uh, if you want to use computer vision to do celebrity recognition feature, you have to request that, which that's not actually new. That one's been there for a bit. The celebrity recognition stuff has been opt-in and re- approval. The Azure Video Indexer to use, again, the celebrity recognition and the face identifying features. The custom neural voice for the pro features of that and speaker recognition feature, all features of the speaker recognition capability uh, all now need to be approved by Azure before you're allowed to just go use them. Uh, They are retiring several features from the Face API, which we talked about in the previous show, including the ability to predict emotion, gender, age, smile, facial hair, hair, and makeup. And they link to more details behind this decision, which we talked about a couple weeks ago here on the show. They're also retiring the Snapshot API, which allowed biometric data transfer from one face subscription to another, and you have until June 30th, 2023, before these are deprecated for you. Uh, of course, the Face API is also being moved out of North Central U.S. region starting June 21st, 2022. The Face API will be retired from North Central U.S. And if you have Face API resources deployed there currently, you have until June 30th, 2023 to move access, which is a really crappy way to deprecate this feature because apparently they couldn't figure out a better way to turn this off without just de-hosting de- uh, it altogether. Yeah, it's I, it's it's funny to be... I'm so conflicted on this. I'm, you know, like on the... The policy lock in me is like, this, you know, is great. We're going to, you know, have people sort of state their use case so that it's not going to be abused. But the the engineer in me is just like, oh, cool. I get to fill out a form to, to try this out. Rad. Yeah. The SRE engineer in me says, great. We deployed a service of production and somebody forgot to run the, run the magic command to enable this feature in, in this particular account for this particular okay. service because it's now a, a, a snowflake that has to be dealt with independently. Um, I know. I'm, I'm just looking forward to the the day when either the EU or or even California under CCPO or something uh, uh, allows individual consumers to opt out of facial recognition. And so yeah, I I want to be able to send a picture of my face from many angles to AWS and to Azure and say, if you see my face in these pictures, do not identify me. Ooh, I like it. You know. That would be a very interesting use case, right? Like, you know, thinking about like the business model for that would be kind of neat too, but it relies on yeah. too much access to data, but wild. So, so in the video, when it, when it's seeing the faces, would it say, call you John Doe or would it just say, <laughs> no, what if you, gray it out. privacy yeah. removed or would it completely gray you out? Cause gray you out should be an option. You should be, Facial you know, the, sovereignty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's my face. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be interesting. Copyright me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, if you're in this space and this makes you unhappy, I'm sure uh, there's a company that will sell you all the bad face API stuff. But I'm sure <laughs> if you're using, yeah, Azure. I mean, but it's it's you know we're we're stifling innovation and hopefully it's worth it. You know, like yeah. Well, I mean, I, it's one of these uh, you know this fight or arms race, right? Like if we don't have it, who says China doesn't have it or Russia or other companies don't have it and can't use this against you just because Azure is not selling it to you doesn't mean it's not out there. So, you mm-hmm. know, and then again, like even an opt out list, like, yes, you'll be opted out of AWS or Azure if they ever came up with that capability. 
Uh, that doesn't mean you'd be covered out of everybody's database, uh, but it's a nice idea. It's a good dream. I think we're just too we're too late. Fortunately, I think it's the problem. I mean, it, is this really just a move to? I, I didn't read the terms and conditions, which you, which we now have to agree to as as far as using the service goes. It, but it, you clicked accept. Uh, you had to have read them. I, it made you scroll most, all the way down most, to the bottom. Most people do. I did, and I control mm-hmm. F, and I found find facial. I, mean, I, I assume this is just to just to stop um, certain use cases, things like law enforcement, because of all the pushback there was um, yeah. a couple of years ago about the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which there's not as, not as much anger about that because we have a different administration now. But you know, if we go back to other other administration again, uh, you know, people will start crying about this again. So it'll you know, get ahead of it now while you have a chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, all right. Well, the gateway load balancer uh, on Azure is now generally available. Uh, this is for use with transparent NVAs or network virtual appliances. Uh, NVAs are typically used for allowing or blocking specific IPs using virtual firewalls, protecting applications from DDoS attacks, or analyzing or visualizing traffic patterns. Uh, like, and so basically this is uh, GWLB is bumping the wire for your load balancer, which now offers ability to preserve source IP, flow symmetry, uh, lightweight NVA management at scale, and auto-scaling with Azure Virtual Machine scale sets. With the GWLB bump in the wire service changing, becomes easy to add on to new or existing architectures in Azure. And this means you can attach a GWLB to both standard public load balancers and individual virtual machines with standard public IPs, converging scenarios involving both high availability, zonally resilient deployments, and simpler workloads. This is one of those features that I'm glad exists. Um, you have to take advantage of it, but you know, like the the high wall gardens of yesteryear where you just denied traffic or tried to keep everything internal and, or, you know, through privately acquired, you know, fiber, you know, I like that you can now react more quickly in, in an automatic way to these things by detecting these things rather than just preventing all things from the, from the get go. And so like it, these are nice, but it still takes a significant investment into, to use them wisely. Agreed. Well, an interesting uh, story came across my desk this week around Microsoft and Netflix. Uh, apparently, Netflix is naming Microsoft as their partner for a new consumer subscription plan, which if you've heard anything about Netflix, uh, they've had a pretty rough 2022. Uh, <laughs> they've had a massive pullback in subscribers. Their stock has been completely beat up, and uh, they've had layoffs and cost-cutting measures and all kinds of things. Uh, and you know, the highlight of their earnings last week was, it wasn't as bad as the prior quarter. <laughs> you know that's a bad, uh, bad situation. <laughs> Uh, and so as part of this, you know, trying to curb this, they're coming out with a new ad-supported consumer subscription plan, which apparently they've decided to partner with Microsoft for. At launch, consumers will have more options to access Netflix content, and marketers looking to Microsoft for their advertising needs will have access to Netflix's audience and premium connected TV inventory. All ads served on Netflix will exclusively be available through the Microsoft platform. And while this isn't really cloud-related, I do have to wonder how much work is Microsoft doing right now trying to get something moved to Azure because they'd love to be able to poach some sweet, sweet cloud revenue from AWS, especially with a oh, marquee yeah. customer like Netflix. Uh, so if they can help my Netflix out on this initiative, uh, maybe they're trying for a bigger bigger fish at the end of the day. Well, I just said the ads download faster than Xbox games do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's... Netflix was the use case for, for AWS and using cloud for so long. You know, it... This is that that's the news to me, but uh, because that's just very interesting. But it's also sort of funny that it's like you know the serving of advertising, you know. So it's like you know associate that with Microsoft, you know, because everyone <laughs> loves watching ads on their on their content. <laughs> well, and you have to sort of wonder, like you know, you wouldn't go to Google because, of course, they're a competitor of yours, and and you know, Amazon is a little bit of a competitor to Netflix, but not you know with Prime, but. It, yeah, they don't really have an advertising network either, other than if you're advertising on the Amazon store. So Azure is kind of your your best bet without having to go with a direct competitor uh, in the space. So it sort of makes sense they went that direction, but then I still have to think that there's there's more to this that Microsoft's thinking. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about the competition. It sounds like it wasn't a t- technology choice. It sounds like it was not a technology choice, more more of a partner choice for, for the ad channels. Correct. But, you know, Microsoft's known for their amazing ad network, right? Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking I was starting um, to, to dislike Microsoft less after after years of, uh, of you know, terrible behaviors and things. And uh, now now they're going to go and do ads for Netflix. So, oh, well, I guess you win some, you lose some. 
I mean, I can fix your 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 you know dislike of Microsoft. You know, I can fix that for you. I just have you come troublesome dot not dot net issues with me uh, during I mean, an outage window. You'll you'll hate them again, no problem. So I'm just, I thought you were going the other way. I'm like, how are you gonna <laughs> make Microsoft better like, yeah, with dot net? Yeah. <laughs> to make his opinion worse, that was my plan. So. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but I also have this opportunity with this story here because this one might make you also feel worse about Microsoft because they are announcing the Microsoft Cloud for Sovereignty, which rolls right off the tongue, a new mm. solution that will enable public sector customers to build and digitally transform workloads in the Microsoft Cloud while meeting their compliance, security, and policy requirements. And as you read through this, you're like, okay, so they're doing something new, right? They're doing something cool. Nope, they are not. <laughs> they've just taken all the existing stuff they've always had and they've just rebranded it underneath the lovely Microsoft Cloud for Sovereignty banner uh, and now giving you things as amazing as Azure Confidential Computing, double key encryption for Microsoft 365, customer lockboxes, which already existed, and of course support for Azure Arc, which they already could do. And the only thing they were actually are delivering out of all of this, as far as I can tell, is uh, some additional GDPR capabilities, as well as some government you know requirements for classifications on compliance, uh, as well as a new sovereign landing zone, which is just the normal landing zone document with some sovereign words added to it. Uh, which is a solution, of course, to simplify the architecture deployment workflow and intelligent tools to orchestrate operations of their various security services and policy controls in a streamlined manner. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, that's you know their answer to Oracle, I guess, and they said you know we're not going to be the we're not going to be the last sovereign cloud. We're going to be the second one after Oracle announced it. Uh, but you didn't really announce anything new here, guys. Just uh, you rebranded the existing thing. So lipstick on a pig. But sovereignty. 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 It's the buzzword of the world. So, mm-hmm. I want the Republic Cloud, damn it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, you already uh, would have won the lightning round twice. Today. It's always missed opportunities for the lightning round. Mm-hmm. I know. You really should have got these stories moved to lightning round and you would have, you would have had a better <laughs> chance. So. Uh, well, at the uh, Partner Summit this week, uh, Inspire 2022 is their big partner event. They announced several updates for the Azure Stack Hyperconverged offering. Hyperconverged, of course, is a fully managed hardware box that Azure sends to you. Uh, and apparently, uh, the first one kind of shocked me because uh, they're now enabling Azure Remote Support. So if your poor Azure Stack HCI had a problem, you had to manually upload your own logs and troubleshoot it with a call with a Microsoft person, shadow surfing your Zoom session or Teams meeting, Ooh. whatever you're doing. It just sounds awful. So now with the Azure Remote Support, they'll be able to log directly into your HCI box. Uh, and do all that troubleshooting for you, leaving you alone to complain about your choices of buying Azure Stack. <laughs> uh, there's a bunch of new features coming to Azure Stack HCI in the second half, including improved hyperver- hypervisor storage and networking performance, a bunch of new networking capabilities, Hyper-V live migrations are now faster, as well as if you have a new uh, HCI stack, because I just sold it so well to you, uh, you will now have a stronger default security posture, a stronger set of protocols and ciphers, and a secured core server Windows Defender app control and other well-known security features, as well as you can now finally use access images from the marketplace on your Azure Stack HCI. So you can now buy your licenses through Marketplace and have them delivered directly to the HCI appliance. Sweet guy, I never thought about the support nightmare of hosting these these cloud components in your data center. Like you know, AWS for for their infrastructure does a really good job of separating out support and access to anything that could have customer sense of data. How the, how do they do that for outposts? Like, hmm. Well, outposts, you know, they do the support on that too. And it calls home and gets us commands from, you know, system center manager and all those things. So yeah, it, it becomes yeah. a big problem this when you're suddenly supporting hardware. Now you have to maintain it. Like what happens in the drive fails? It's really tricky. Yeah. I'm assuming it doesn't send all the data out of the country. Yeah. The biggest issue is actually, I think, trying to deal with all of the different data center colos that exist in the world and all the access lists that someone from Amazon Outpost support would have to have. Like, okay, I have to go to this customer who's at Equinix. Am I on the access list? Is there an access ticket? Okay, now I need to go to Internap, and they require this other thing. Like, I could, and all the background mm-hmm. checks required for all that. Like, oh, <laughs> like I don't want to. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Nope. Just ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss yeah. on this one. You can see why they all pivoted to like sending out, you know, you know, two rack unit servers instead of the the giant racks, which you still can do, but you know, like mm-hmm. very quick to sell it by individual hardware component rather than by rack. Well, I think you get to the point where you're like, we're just going to ship you comp- full compute units, and then if this one has a component that dies, you just replace the whole compute unit. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. send you another one. Oh, for sure. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, if you're into the Bitcoin thing, which is not going so well in the economy either <laughs> at the moment, uh, Azure Confidential Ledger is now officially generally available. Azure Confidential Ledger is an unstructured trusted data store for important identifiers of sensitive data that require high integrity. The data records stored on Azure Confidential Ledger remain immutable and can be crypto verified. If it offers a simple experience with REST APIs that can be easily integrated into your app architecture. And if you didn't pick it up from the name Confidential Ledger, you should know that it utilizes Azure Confidential Computing and the Confidential Consortium Framework to provide high levels of integrity that is protected and evident. I do have a quote here from Avenid, a Fergus Kidd Research and Development Engineering Lead. Uh, and I think they are in tax uh, reporting, by the way. Confidential computing is an evolution of how data is secured during processing. Avenade believes it will be critical as organizations begin to collaborate and share data in new ways, whether for customer-sensitive data in finance and healthcare, or as part of the digital transformations happening now in manufacturing and logistics. Azure Confidential Ledger is a secure and flexible solution allowing developers to store any data in a trusted environment backed by blockchain technology. Unlike other blockchain solutions, configuration and custom setup requirements are minimal. ACL is a lightweight addition to Microsoft's Confidential Compute Services, and the other information should be stored immutably with ease. ACL can form part of any solution requiring provenance for sensitive data with hardware-backed guarantees that storing and processing activities are tamper-proof. ACL is ideally suited for data owners to track, monitor, and audit changes over time securely. And Fergus, if you uh, listen to the show and you talk this way, I would love to meet you <laughs> and have a conversation because that was very buzzwordy, and I'd love to know more. <laughs> I fell asleep because I didn't think it said anything. <laughs> it's not a lot of buzzwords. <laughs> like, I'm sure he's a very nice person. I, I mean, you're hard pressed to get me to care about, you know, crypto and Bitcoin and NFTs in general, just because like until it's real, I'm not going to pay it and spend my time on it. And, you know, like, so it's, I mean, they're real, already real scams. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are we still on that story? Um, kind of makes you wonder, right? How, how have banks and other organizations survived all this time without having this amazing technology available to them? Without having, you know, <laughs> like, why all of a sudden do we care about distributed immutability of, of, of a ledger when we've, we've had compliance requirements and, all, and, um, and technological requirements that, that needed this, this type of data safety before? Like, wh- why is this a better solution? I don't think it is. I mean, I think, I think in no. many ways they... You know, a lot of like the electronic fund transfer thing where, you know, all the checks go to a centralized place and then they get, you know, they go, hey, I have this check from this bank. And I don't know what they call that. I forget the name at this moment, but clearinghouse. Yeah. Yeah. uh, You know, that whole process was very manual and they used to send checks by paper, (laughs) you know, to that thing. And so, you know, you're, this is, I think more of a technology can improve a a very legacy process is why this is something people are doing. But, um, you know, they've also digitized a lot of that clearinghouse process now. So mm. and if they've already digitized it, why do they need it immutably? I don't know. So yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. And I also don't have enough insight into this market to understand it fully. And every time I try to le- learn about Web 3.0, I just cry a little bit and close the page because it just is so complicated for no value as far as I can tell. Yeah. I mean, the the, the idea is nice. The, the idea of a distributed system is nice. You know, if, if, if money wasn't involved in Bitcoin... And and we had millions of nodes throughout the world independently verifying each other's things. Then then that type of distributed ledger is is great. But the thing is, because money becomes involved, we have huge organizations that run so many nodes on the network that they have effectively the power to um, to change the ledger. Yeah. To, to deny deny transactions or, or modify the ledger. So I mean, if it, if it was a true distributed ledger, it's it's wonderful. It's great. I'd love to see something like that work. Um, however, when when a cloud provider provides a distributed ledger service from one of twenty five data centers and that globally, it's not distributed enough. You're just moving the trust from from SQL Server to this Azure service instead of something else. Like if if you really need to put things in the hands of people, if you want it to call it a distributed ledger. Um, I, I do actually believe the Azure Confidential Ledger is a SQL Server feature. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's part of SQL Server, technically. Uh, so, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Anyways. Anyway. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> uh, well, our final Azure story, fine, thank goodness, uh, is that for those of you who are you know not cutting costs right now and you need a new way to burn your Azure money faster, the new general availability of premium series hardware for Azure SQL Managed instances is now available to you. 
The Premium Series Hardware and Azure SQL Managed Instance offer industry-leading performance and price performance thanks to the predatory licensing, of course, among SQL Server Cloud database services, providing a perfect platform for you to migrate more of your large database applications in the cloud. And with the general availability of the memory optimized version coming later this fall, this may not be for you quite yet. Uh, I also would say that you should look at the specs of this because when you compare the standard series Gen 5 to the new premium series, there's not a lot of difference. (laughs) Mostly 300 megahertz per core uh, improvement in performance from the CPU side. And then the same number of cores are available. uh, And then memory per core goes from 5.1 gigabytes per vCore to 7 gigabytes per vCore. Uh, and that's the only differences. So if you need 300 megahertz per processor and you need uh, two gigabytes more per core in memory for caching, uh, this has you set up. But uh, I would I assume if you're using a SQL Server, you need memory optimized, and that's not here yet. Well, I mean, you've already thrown away all logic, and you're not optimizing your queries. You're trying to throw hardware at a problem that you know solves it because the, the DBAs don't know what to do. So yeah, this makes sense. From that perspective, you're right. I can see it. <laughs> I'm in. More memory, more servers. More memory. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. the rule of .NET. More you don't need, you know, .NET apps don't need CPU, so SQL doesn't either. It's all memory. Store it all memory and cache. Mm-hmm. In a year and a half, Moore's Law will save us in a year yeah. and a half. And then we run out of Moore's Law, so then what do you do? Uh, well, we have an Oracle story, which is also a Google story, but it happened to Oracle first, so we're going to blame them. Uh, but as we talked about at the top of the show, uh, London uh, is on fire this week <laughs> with record temperatures over 40 uh, Celsius or for us Americans, 104 Fahrenheit. Uh, and apparently Oracle and Google leveraged the same guys set up the Texas power grid because they were not <laughs> able to handle the cooling <laughs> necessary for their data centers. Uh, and they both had major outages uh, impacting their London regions due to cooling system failures at their facilities uh, Oracle was first hit, which is why they're well, we're putting in the Oracle section early morning Pacific time uh, on the 19th, uh, followed by Google a few hours later. And Google said that they were powering down some parts of its cloud services to prevent damages to machines and an extended outage of their region. Uh, I think I last saw it last about four and a half hours total before they were able to bring services back up as the sun set uh, and the temperatures came back to a reasonable temperature. So uh, I would be asking for some root causes from your Oracle and Google uh, sales reps, of how they're going to prevent this from happening again. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to be like, too hot. Yeah. yeah. Too what hot. do you do? Yeah. I can't imagine being in that position where you're sitting there like it, with, I don't know if Oracle had this ability, but Google sure did because they, they did shut down services proactively. Like that's a crap decision. Like that sucks. There's nothing you can do at that point. You can't magically make it colder or install ACs for a heat wave. Well, that's rough. What was it that failed? I, I haven't seen what the actual root cause was of of the failure. I mean, was it a, was it an external dependency that failed? Was it power delivery to the data centers that had a problem because of high temperatures? And that that often happens in high temperatures. Mm-hmm. Or was it actually a function of the data center itself and the HVAC system at the data center? Because um, I, I I think. That'll be interesting to dig into when, we, when the details come out. But only only like one in 200 homes in the UK have any kind of air conditioning. You know, Everyone has heaters, radiators, all kinds of stuff like that. Virtually nobody has any kind of air conditioning. It's just unheard of. So, I mean, the, the article is not clear, but my guess is that they literally just did not have the necessary air handlers to deal with the Delta, right? You've got thousands of machines pumping out hot air you need to convert that and remove that heat and exchange it outside if you don't have enough air handlers it just gets really hot in your data center. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well specifically on the on the google stats page um where they talk about this incident and the recovery of it uh, they say a cooling related failure in one of their buildings that hosts zone europe west 2a for region europe west 2 was impacted and that's what caused the issue so there's so google saying it was a, a cooling system failure which you know, I would assume they would be n plus one redundant, but maybe not, because <laughs> again, they're well. But it's not it's not about the redundancy necessarily, because thermodynamics, like it's, it's capacity. The well, the the cooling is less efficient, right? But, so mm-hmm. like it's so you, you can run it all you want, but it's not going to cool your air as much when it's that hot outside. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because I know Intel back in the day did a big study where they put servers and a circus tent in the desert of Las Vegas and put fans on it. And they, they figured out that the failure rate wasn't mar- you know, materially different 
as long as they kept air flowing through the, the tent at all times. And so it was really about ex, you know, removing the hot air when you needed it to be removed before it caused damage. That was really the key learning they had. But you know, that was you know, 15 years ago. Uh, so I don't know. Now with newer, higher densities of servers, I don't know if that's even still a thing. Because you know, I remember being at a data center back in the late 90s, and we had a cooling failure. You just threw the door open and got some big fans and just blew air into it. Yeah, <laughs> and, totally. and all was fine. <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I, I imagine it's a different world now because uh, of density, but, uh, you know, you have to wonder if some of these tricks would also maybe at least to help mitigate some impact. Although it was very hot outside too, so <laughs> who knows? Yeah. I, I, I guess yeah. I guess there's two different types of failure, isn't there? There's the HVAC system failed because of the heat, because right. there was a problem with the HVAC system itself, or there's the HVAC system could not deal with the, the, the delta of temperatures between inside and outside, which is a capacity issue. And so mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, I'm waiting to see whether it's the first thing rather than the second thing, because yeah. um, and I'd, be, I'd be very surprised if it, if it was a capacity thing. I mean, the it, second thing can cause the first yeah. thing, too, as it tries to scale up. It was and the it second thing. It cooks itself. It was the second yeah. thing. It didn't happen when it was 20 degrees Celsius outside. It happened when it was 40 degrees Celsius. Yeah, it, it most likely is a, is the equilibrium problem. But again, yeah. like the, and, and you know, looking at the, what I read in the news, they're saying that, Temperatures this high are not expected in London till 2050, uh, and it's only 2022, so <laughs> it's much earlier than uh, they expected this type of temperature to hit London. So, you know, again, thinking about a data center, you're designing, you had to replace those equipment, you know, a major AC unit for a data center probably gets replaced every 10 to 15 years. You know, you probably could have designed it from a capacity side of, well, we're not going to have that temperature issue if you look at the long-term forecast, so I don't know. Yeah, it's it's probably a, a sign of further issues to come, I would think, unless yeah. they do some proactive work. Because it's it's one thing to, to, to say, you know, in the middle of the United States, we build data center in Utah or somewhere. It's one thing to, to, to say, yes, look, it gets up to 45 degrees C right there, but the sun's heating the air under some land. And that's a completely different situation than heating up Europe, which is much further north, much, much, much less expected to have those kind of temperatures so far north. I mean, most of Europe is is around about the latitude of the border between the US and Canada. Uh-huh. And the second thing is there's a whole lot of ocean all around Europe. And uh, if it's that hot, then the ocean is that hot. And the humidity is, uh, you may, I mean, we know from AC here, you know, you use different systems in Florida where it's, where it's humid versus in the desert where it's dry. Um, you have to remove the heat from the air as well as the heat from the uh, the water. You know, you condense the water around, get rid of it someplace. So, yeah, it's going to be time to invest in HVAC business, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I guess. Cause, and then it's going to be weird because it's going to be, you're going to have to just, mm. you know, design for a new spike. Yeah. Right? Because it's not going to be consistent. It's going to be, it's not going to be 45C you know, in perpetuity where it's like, if this is an easy decision, it's going to be like, maybe it happens again. Yeah, I mean, a lot of data centers use effectively swamp coolers. Don't they? they they go through hundreds of thousands of gallons of water, swamp cool the air. That's not mm-hmm. that's not going to work. Yeah. In, uh, Unless yeah. it gets well, colder uh, instead of warmer, like the predictions when uh, <laughs> the uh, no, I mean when the uh, the currents uh, stop swirling and the warm water stops coming up from uh, from right. the equator. It's supposed yeah. to get cooler in the UK, not warmer. Home, homework for everybody. I, I thought we were going to see extremes on both ends, right? It's going to be colder and warmer, which is even funner for designing yeah, it's, it's these gonna systems. Be, it's going to be much bigger, uh, much bigger swings between the two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Everyone go home. I, mean, I don't know who made, Brit- you know, made Jonathan, you know, king of the British weather stuff because you know, he lived there or something. I hey, I, I did a geography project when I was thirteen years old on the weather. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> and I tell you, my uh, my grade that I got for it sucked as much as the weather does there. So <laughs> <laughs> lovely, very very well done, Jonathan. <laughs> Meteorologist was not your future. Hmm. Yeah, lives in sunny California now. Hmm. Yeah. There is a reason I do not live there anymore. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, Peter, it's time for the lightning round once again. Let's take it to it. The Amazon Time Stream announces improved cost effectiveness with updates to metadata metering. It's about time. <laughs> ah! <laughs> nice, nicely done. <sighs> Hang up my hat and walk uh, out now. I was wondering who the meter maids were for the time stream, but yours is better. So it's a ticket. AWS Lambda Power Tools for TypeScript now generally available. There are dozens of us, dozens of us who wanted this feature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ones of us. There are ones of us. Yeah. 
AWS Firewall Manager now supports AWS Network Firewall strict rule order with alert and drop configurations. I mean, I'm glad it's strict because if my firewall isn't strict, I'd be pretty concerned about it. Well, it is pretty fun to debug non-strict rule orders. Like, which one of these rules is, is screwing me right now? Yeah. <laughs> the answer is all of them. <laughs> how, about, uh, how about a little OCIQ limited availability program? For you. I was mostly impressed about the the work they did to not call it Kafka or a simple queue. They just went with OCIQ. Well done. Yes. <laughs> I waited for a while. Credit. I waited for a while, but I didn't get into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. Australian government certifies Oracle Cloud infrastructure under the hosting certification framework. Crikey. <laughs> <laughs> all right and let's talk about moving data from the mainframe to google cloud made easy a clear sign that google was born in the internet era because nothing about the mainframe is easy <laughs> yeah. yep yeah all i can think about is princess bride this word does not mean what <laughs> <laughs> And that wraps it up. It's about time Ryan gets a point. Woo! Woo! He took it early, too. That was impressive. Yeah. I usually never come out of the box. Yeah. It just awesome. cracked me. It just caught me so off guard. Because <laughs> he never has a joke that's funny. I know. That's why it caught you off guard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, many, many things are coming up. Uh, by the time this episode drops, it'll be right about time for Reinforce, for real this time, because it is actually July, and it is actually almost July 26th. Uh, Scale is coming up in Los Angeles, which is the largest community-run open source and free software conference uh, down in Los Angeles. Uh, and there's all kinds of events going on there, including the AWS Cloud Native Builder Day, followed by Black Hat USA for all your laptops that you want to throw away, and then VMworld uh, to learn how to virtualize your private data center because you're too afraid to go to the cloud uh, all coming up in the next couple months here and much much more coming up in the fall with of course google cloud next reinvent and microsoft events as well and that is it for another fantastic week here in the cloud good night good night bye everybody see you later and that is the week in cloud we'd like to thank our sponsor foghorn consulting subscribe on itunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag the cloud pod or join our Slack channel, go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions. Uh, so did, did you guys uh, see that Slack uh, is increasing prices? And, I did, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it I, was I, every banner in every private room. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, oh. And I, I got a little nervous when it first came out because I was like, "Oh no, this is the moment where <laughs> Salesforce screws the Cloud Pod by taking our free free Slack room that we use and turning it into paid." Uh, and actually, they gave us better features. So before we would, uh, all of our messages after ten thousand uh, would get deleted, and five gigs of, of uploads would get deleted. And now it's moving to a time based thing. Uh, so they'll basically show us anything for the last ninety days, which is more than enough. So. It's so right. much better too. Nobody knows how many ten thousand messages is. Everybody yeah. knows how long ninety days is. So, like to prep for losing stuff. So it's yeah, great. Exactly. I love it. Yeah. Well, and, and you, I you hate do, everything you, about this. Ah! You guys are all wrong. <laughs> yeah. The only the only people that benefits are the people that send their alerting directly to Slack. Yeah, exactly. That was me. Like, <laughs> you mean RSS feeds that we process for uh, for the show through the through our Slack channel? Like, man, like we ten thousand messages is like three days. Like, it's crazy. It's funny reading the article though, and uh, all the posts even. Um, and they said, you know, we haven't increased prices since what was it, twenty fourteen? Twenty fourteen, yeah. And, and and my first thought is because it was so damn expensive already. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I remember, I remember why we chose HipChat because HipChat was two dollars a user per month, and yeah. so you, you look at that compared to you know the original prices was eight dollars a month if you paid monthly, or six sixty seven if you paid annually, and that's going up to eight seventy five and seven twenty five respectively. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, it was, it was ridiculously expensive back in 2014 because hip chat and IRC and all these other things existed. Um, you know, and it's, it's also interesting to me that this is only affecting the, the business plus plans. Uh, you know, if you're on custom enter, oh, sorry, the business plus is not impacted business plus and custom enterprise are not impacted by the increases. So it's only if you're the business tiers, 
uh, that you're getting screwed by this. So like your smallest customers who have the most potential to get bigger, who probably could go to teams the easiest, you've just now said you're getting a price increase. Well done, Slack. Yep. Well done. Yep. Well, I'll say that yeah. uh, we're getting hit by the price increase and I didn't even blink at it because this tool is so valuable to our company. I don't even want to think about what we do without it. It's just, we love the features. We love the collaboration. And if it's 75 cents per user per month more, it, it's just going to turn us to from probably from monthly to annual, which is fine. But, uh, I mean, that's a good yeah, saving. That's a dollar twenty five. Sorry, dollar yeah. fifty a month, basically in savings per user. So yeah, I, I mean, you should have been paying annually already, but that's okay. Yeah. We love it. <laughs> it's true, uh, but we love it. Vendor lock in. But you know the thing. I, 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 the thing I was hoping in this whole deal was because the big competitor with Teams is that Teams is free, and so all these companies mm-hmm. are moving to Teams, and that's why they got off Slack, and so they lost a bunch of customer base because of that. And what I'd rather have happened is Salesforce basically say, we're getting rid of Chatter. And if you have a Salesforce prescription, we're going to give you, you know, for every Salesforce salesperson, we're going to give you X number of seats of normal Slack. And we're going to give you basically that business tier for free. That's what I wanted Slack to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and that's what I think they should do. And then if they want these more enterprise features, you know, that Teams charges for those as well. Uh, at least then it's on equal footing. But as long as they're charging for this business tier, uh, you know, it's always going to be a hard sell to justify that seven twenty five or eight seventy five a month versus Teams, unfortunately. Especially once you get to a certain scale, right? Like that's mm-hmm. yeah, that's like, up. That's always where you know, it's if you're small, you know, you can pivot and you can dance the right tool that you need. But when you're mid enterprise to large enterprise, like these, well, I realize that that those plans aren't part, you know, of this price increase. You bet your renewal discussion is going to reference these per seat per you know, see increases per seats and it's just going to go up and it's astronomical. I wish I understood the economics of the, of the pricing model actually. Like, I mean, uh, one mar- what's the margin on a, u- yeah. on a user in, in that tier? I mean, eight dollars, how, me- how many messages do they send? Like how much, how many uploads do they make exactly? What is the margin? I bet you it's, Terribly inefficient yeah. and really expensive to run. So do I. Yeah, I think. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean that, that, it's interesting because the free tier, which again, as soon as I saw an announcement from Slack that the prices going up, I was like, the free tier screwed because they mm-hmm. don't they don't even use ads in the free tier. Like, there's no advertising that's getting dumped into there, which I would expect, you know, for a free product like this. Um, and so it, it can't be that inefficient because they couldn't be able to offer a free tier if the margins were that bad on these paid customers, because all the paid customers and the enterprise customers have to basically pay for all the infrastructure for the whole platform because everything else is free. So I don't, I don't know how inefficient or efficient it actually is. I'd love to understand that better, but um, it it just feels like a way to goose profits and well, inflation's up. So, you know, everyone's used to prices going up right now. So just suck it. Well, presumably free tier is a, is a great sales phone for, for the business plan though. And so right, well, the cloud pod hasn't bought and we've been on it now for two and a half years and we have no plans to buy. <laughs> so I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, until you need the features of, you know, one of the, the higher level plans, like it's, but I mean, th- you know, th- for me again, like the, the, the 10,000 messages versus the 90 days, like I'd rather have something I can reference. I'd rather be able to store documents. And, you know, that was the dream of Slack at least, you know, several years ago, which is it's going to replace email. It's going to replace wikis and document stores. And now moving to a 90-day model, no chance of that. Well, I mean, it wasn't really replacing that before either because five gigs worth of uploads would get used right. up pretty quick. 90 days, huh? Yeah, and I think I, I, I think that, that that vision was a little too grandiose anyway. I, mean, I like the vision of it replacing all of... Like, definitely replace email, you know, and create a lot more synchronous collaboration in your company when otherwise you were stuck with asynchronous tools. But, um, but yeah, don't, don't use it as a file store or repo store. Like, although I do like the little shortcut links and stuff, but that's great, dude. Like give me my channel. Let me put my shortcut to my confluence page that, you know, or, uh, uh, wiki site that relates to that subject in there. And then, focus all the features on synchronous collaboration talk to people stuff like that yeah yeah but then you're stuck with you know confluence search Boo. i agree it's not ideal but um <laughs> it's just like you can't you can't do everything and i think if slack focuses on synchronous communication and collaboration or synchronous collaboration then they're better off than trying to do it all 
Mm -hmm. That's definitely their strong point. Yeah. But I mean, like, you know, your, your company, you know, has a reasonable amount of people who are in this Slack team and you share it with your partners and customers, all that. So I, in most cases for, you know, like Foghorn, for example, you're always going to have Slack because you're always going to have customers who have Slack. But also, yep. I assume you get some pressure to use Teams as well because you also we have customers who are on Teams. And we do you know, use do you, Teams. Do you find that your population prefers one or the other or is it just yes. kind of where they live? My population prefers one. <laughs> <laughs> I but wonder we use, which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, we use, but we use whatever our customers are most comfortable with. But yes, our population <laughs> prefers one. <laughs> Which one, Peter? The, the public wants to know. <laughs> uh, well, you can all guess which one that is. Because uh, yeah, having, yeah. having now used Teams, I... It's Slack. Yeah. I, I think I've, I think I, I've already I mean, given it. He's not going to disparage Microsoft <laughs> and, and answer that question. He's going to tell you that Teams is an amazing product. But I can tell you, mm -hmm. as I'm not a partner, that I hate Teams in so many ways. Uh, you know, it... it there's one job, right? You said you're going to compete against Slack. That was your one mission. And so you decided that you're going to create the jack of all trades of communication and collaboration. Like I'm going to make a meeting product. Okay, we're going to use we're going to use Skype for business as a baseline for that. And that's not so bad. I, I'll give them props. The meetings, decent. One-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one chats with you know my coworkers. It's it's reasonable, except for I can only pin 15 of them. <laughs> So you can't pin more than that, which is an arbitrary limit for no reason. Uh, Nor can you integrate those ad hoc chats like from. I thought it was because of my 64K of memory on my box. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's terrible. And then you can also do you can do group messages, which is not terrible. But then like the one feature you're supposed to be copying from Slack, which is, you know, the actual team rooms is garbage mm -hmm. fire. Like we decided mm -hmm. we're going to copy topics. We're going to take topics from Slack, which everyone hates. No one likes topics. Everyone hates <laughs> threads. No one uses that feature. And if you do use it, I just hate you. Like, it's a fine, <laughs> yeah. like, if you're going back to a message, like, 25 minutes ago, and you're like, hey, I want to mention, like, fine. Okay, that's a reasonable use for threads. Other than that purpose, there's no thing. And that's the entire point of Teams is, like, everything is a f***ing thread. Why? Why does that have to be a thread? It doesn't need to be a thread. It doesn't require this purpose. And now Microsoft's trying to dump like Power BI into it and workflow and a bunch of other crap that makes no sense to me that should be live inside my Teams environment. And I just have to suffer through all of it. I'm yeah. But yeah. You had one job, copy Slack and do it well, and you failed. Like it's so annoying. Oddly silent. <laughs> Because <laughs> I try not to bust up laughing because I'm so angry about this. There's, yeah. something, uh, there's something else the other day too that we talked about. Teams had one job that they were supposed to they were all supposed to copy something and they they sucked at it too. I don't remember what that was, but it wasn't as egregious as the topic threading problem. I, they're so bad at like they're they're bad at integrations. Their their ability to sort of other than you know the integration with other Microsoft products, which is fantastic by the way. Um, it's is it though because someone passed me a table and i tried to copy that table to excel and it just dumped it in as text it was so annoying like oh really yeah <laughs> so i'm always i was impressed when someone copies like a part of you know a document and it just shows up natively in like a an excel app or yeah or Word that app. does work pretty nice mm -hmm. and then meetings is is you know pretty nice i gotta say yeah so Google on your you know fiftieth try to make a chat collaboration app you know just copy stuff. Oh, they're please. not solving this. Oh God, they're not solving. <laughs> please don't Google. Just no. Uh, you know they're gonna try. <laughs> you know they're gonna of course try. They'll try. They're gonna try. At some point they have to, right? Uh, you know, especially if Teams and Slack are competing with them, or they just bought. They could have just bought Slack. But no, no, they let it go to Salesforce. Like idiots. No, no, no. Yeah. And what I still don't understand why Salesforce bought that. I like they and they haven't done anything with it since they bought it. Like this is very confusing. Well, I, I learned that I basically have come to the conclusion that Salesforce is the new IBM, which just stuff gets bought by them to die. I mean, what have they done with Heroku? Mm -hmm. What have they done with MuleSoft? What have they done with anything they've acquired lately? Nothing. It's just nothing. It's yeah. just shelfware for the most part. Yeah. Thanks, Benoit. We appreciate that. Yeah. You didn't have to take that part of the Oracle, you know, the Oracle lesson you learned. Yeah, just kill companies. <laughs> you didn't have to do that part. You could have been better. Yeah. You were the chosen one. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. We've been watching Obi-Wan Kenobi. So it's a good show. Good show. 
All right, guys. Well, I, uh, I, I'm i happy to hear that Slack is still going to support our free channel because I was I was dreading the day of having to move us all to Discord for the Cloud Pod. That's going to be a nightmare. So, because <laughs> the damn hippies and my kids, I have to teach them how to use it. Yeah, it's it's mostly just having to admit to my son that I'm on Discord. Yeah, exactly, which would be, would be horrible. All right. Talk to you guys later. See you later. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye.